I was telling my wife on the way over here. 1993, I graduated high school, went off to basic training, security police school in the Air Force, ground combat school. I got back from all that mess. November, just in time to catch the tail end of deer season. <laughs> Shot a few deer and my neighbor, an older man, he was a trapper. And I was sitting on all this money. You don't spend money when you're in the military training all the time. You don't have time to spend it. So I had a, a full bank account, no girlfriend. And I said, I'm not getting a job. I'm going to live on this money. And the neighbor guy was a trapper. And I liked to trap too. And he and I ran long trap line. We'd leave out of Greenwood, Arkansas, and we'd go all the way to Mansfield and back. And then the second half, we left out of Greenwood and went all the way to Vesta and back. And my wife said, have you ever been here? I said, yeah, I think it was in 1993. I said, I caught the biggest, prettiest bobcat I've ever caught in my life in Best of Arkansas. It was spotted like a leopard. And uh, that's my sweet memory of Vesta. I just want to share that with you. You'll be happy to know that I did not go to seminary and I do know how to tell time. I know we're eating immediately after this message and I know what time it is, so I'm going to try to be rather brief. I'm going to cue you in before we get started on the secret Baptist code. You see, I can preach as fast as you can listen. But Baptists have a secret code that even the Methodists don't know about. If you agree with me, you don't have to shout amen or hallelujah. Just give me one of these. If you're nodding your head up and down, I assume you understand what I'm saying, and we'll just cover and move on through it. If you look at me all fuzzed up and like you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm going to slide it down in a lower gear, and I'll explain it. If you're hungry... You keep nodding, we'll get there quicker than you, but you, would, you would any other way. I want you to open your Bible up to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. I'm going to focus our attention today on verses 14 and 15. The sufficiency of the scriptures in the church. If there's one thing the sufficiency of the scriptures have been tossed out on, it is on the qualif in, in Baptist life anyways, it is becoming the qualifications of a pastor. Southern Baptists are confused about what a pastor is. One of the largest Southern Baptist congregations out in California ordained three women pastors. Southern Baptist spent two years trying to figure out if that was right or wrong. I, with a high school education, could tell you with a moment's reading, you must be the husband of one wife. I have a hard time figuring out how the wife can be the wife of one husband and also hold the office of the husband. But because they would not look at 1 Timothy 3, at the qualifications of a pastor, the qualifications of a deacon, the problem that Baptists have today is they fought the battle for inerrancy. You see, back in the 70s, there were Baptists saying the Bible's not true. And people like W.A. Criswell and uh, Adrian Rogers and Charles Stanley, as mentioned earlier, stood up and we had the battle for the Bible. And we got back and we won our seminaries back and we said, now the, we have seminaries that teach the Bible's true. That's inerrancy. They stopped shy of where they should have went. Sufficiency. Not only is the Bible all true, the Bible's all we need. And that's what happened. We said it was true, but then we started inserting culture in there. Yeah, well, it's true, but if culture disagrees, who are we going with? Yeah, it's true, but if tradition disagrees, who do we go with? Yeah, it's true, but if my feelings disagree, who do we go with? Verse 14, 1 Timothy 3. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. The first thing I want to direct our attention to is verse 14, and I want to talk about Revelation. Revelation. Paul said, These things I speak unto you. 
No. But Paul said, these things I wish unto you. No. Paul said, these things write I unto you. Paul wrote down what Timothy needed to know about how to behave himself. This was not a whisper in private. This was written in parchment. Now, friend, what's the purpose of Paul writing it down? What's the purpose of Paul writing down what Timothy needs to know? Why would Paul write it down? If we write it down, we can study it. If we write it down, we can learn it. We men have a problem with instructions written down. Did your wife ever go buy something you had to put together? Oh, I don't need that piece of paper. I'm, a, I'm practically a carpenter. I can tell how this goes together. And next thing you know, you've got it together and you've got leftover parts. Well, honey, what are these for? Oh, those are extras. That's for people who don't know what they're doing. If they mess something up, we've got extra parts. But if it's written down, we can go to, to the instruction manual and we can look at it. And we can go, oh, 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 okay. Uh, th that's a different screw. That screw don't reach all the way into the other side of the entertainment center. See, Paul said, I'm writing it down. You can study it and learn it. Paul said, I'm writing it down, not only so you can study it, so you can scrutinize it. Well, that's not really what he said. Well, that might have been what he said, but that's not what he meant. He probably had another word in mind. Have you ever used the wrong word when you were talking? I didn't mean you as ugly. I just meant you wasn't beautiful. I misspoke. But Paul wrote it down. And since you write it down, not only can you study it and learn from it, you can scrutinize it and compare it with other writings. You see, here's what we have in the Word of God. We can take each of the 66 books and every chapter and every verse and every book and we can scrutinize it with the other 65 books, chapters, and verses and we can compare them and we can tell that this book matches this book. And Moses, what he wrote, is in harmony with what John wrote at the end of the book. And every writer in the book can be scrutinized by the other writers in the book because it's written down. It's written down, we can scrutinize it. <clears throat> Number three, we can spread it. Did you ever play that game in school where your teachers would sit you all in a circle and the teacher would whisper in somebody's ear, the monkey eats a banana. And you would whisper, the monkey eats a banana. And then somebody else would hear something that said, there's a trunk full of bananas. And then somebody, you know, because you, you don't want anybody else to hear the whisper, and you whisper all the way around the circle. By the time it gets back, you don't have a monkey eating a banana. You've got a trunk that's, I'm trying to think of something that rhymes with banana off the top of my head. You have a trunk that belongs to Miss Anna. You see, what's happened is if you're passing it on orally, orally, and somebody gets it wrong and somebody doesn't remember it right, and if Grandpa's mind starts slipping and he doesn't pass it on to the kids early enough, then what ends up happening is the story changes because it's, it's, it's orally heard. But if it's written down, you can spread it and share it, and you can go back and say, no, that's the, the original said this. We have it written down. I'm glad that our Constitution is written down, aren't you? I'm glad the Bill of Rights are written down, aren't you? I I'm glad the Declaration of Independence is written down, aren't you? I'm glad that up there behind a the glass case under the protection of our military, those documents are laid there so that somebody from Congress can't walk up and wad it up and throw it away and say, now I'm going to tell you what that said. We write it down. We can study it. We can scrutinize it. We can spread it. We write it down. We can put a signature on it. You ever heard someone say, put your John Hancock right here? Why do we say that? Who's John Hancock? John Hancock signed the Declaration of Independence, and he signed it in letters that a blind man could read. 
He wrote John Hancock. Everybody else is like this. Who was that? Was that Patrick Henry? Was that Patrick Holmes? Who, who was that? Nobody doubted that John Hancock signed it because he wrote his name real big. Why did he do that? He wanted everybody to know that you have a problem with the document, you can come and talk to its author because I signed off on it. You see, when Paul wrote this down, he gave... Timothy validation that this came from Paul. Why is that important? Because a lot of books were written after the book of Revelation and signed by people who weren't even around when they were claimed to be written. Have you ever heard of anybody talking about the lost books of the Bible? As if God was like, where did I put that other book? Did I? Is that on my, where did I put the other book? God's never lost anything. They're not lost, they're imposters. The reason that Paul wrote this down and signed his name to it and sent it to Timothy is so that Timothy could validate that this is what was said. You see, revelation comes to us written form. I'm not saying God can't talk. He's well able to talk. He spoke audibly in the past. He can speak audibly in the future. But you listen to me. He's never going to audibly speak unto you anything that contradicts what he wrote down. Because our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And God's never once going to look down from heaven and go, you know what, I got a better idea. God's never going to look down from heaven and go, you know what, it just occurred to me. God's never going to look down from heaven and go, well, maybe we should do it another way. God's never going to look down from heaven and go, well, I know I told the rest of the church this, but I'm going to tell Harold something different. It's written down so that we can scrutinize it, study it, spread it, compare the signatures and validate it. The scriptures are not hearsay. We struggle with hearsay. Well, Grandpa always said, what if Grandpa was always wrong? Well, Grandma used to say, well, where'd Grandma get her information? It's not hearsay. It's not oral history. You know, my family, big hunters, and they like to tell old hunting stories, and some of those old hunting stories get better every time you tell them. <laughs> Have you noticed that? The little eight point that Grandpa shot's nearly Boone and Crockett by the time we get done telling it because, you know, Uncle Donnie missed it first. In order to make the story better, we exaggerate the non-essential parts. If the Bible was oral history passed down from Grandpa to Grandpa to Grandpa, well, you know, Grandpa, he was prone, he was a fisherman, you know, he'd tell a little fishing story. It's not oral history. And it's not given to us by an imposter. This book was closed by the end of the first century. Amen. Nobody coming along afterwards writing. No one who was not a visible eyewitness to the Lord Jesus Christ wrote this book. Nobody in the 1600s is going, hey, I got an idea. Let me write book number 67 and add it to the book. You see, when Paul writes it down and he sends this information to Timothy, he's not sending Timothy the complete Bible. But what Paul is doing is demonstrating why he writes it down. He writes it down so that you don't get confused, you don't doubt, and you can know with absolute certainty what God wants us to know, just like Paul can tell Timothy exactly what Timothy needs to know. Second thought, we see Revelation in verse 14. Let's look at the reason for his writing in the first part of verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Did your parents teach you not to run in church? I'm going to look around the room. They tell you not to wear a hat in church? Why didn't Paul say no running in church and no hats in church? The behavior that Paul was interested in was not so much kids running in church or 
wearing hats in church. The church I went to had kind of a nylon carpet. And if I got to wear my dress shoes, I didn't run in church. I shuffled my feet. Come handshaking time, I would like a little human hot wire going around wanting to shake hands with everybody and shock them. My mom started sending me to school in a suit and white tennis shoes, so that wouldn't happen. She said, I'm going to teach you how to behave in church. Paul's not writing to a child. He's writing to a grown man. As a matter of fact, he's writing to the interim pastor at Ephesus. Timothy's not staying there. He's there for a reason to get Ephesus out of some trouble and back on their feet and help them find good pastors to take over so that Timothy can go to Paul if Paul can't come there. The governing of church behavior in our day can fall into two categories. And depending on which category you're in will determine how you receive the text. There is a thing called the regulative principle of worship. And that means we can only do in church what we have a scriptural example of doing in the scriptures. There's the normative principle of worship that means we can do anything that doesn't contradict what the scriptures tell us to do. I personally lean towards the normative principle of worship. Here's why. I believe that the scriptures are sufficient. And I believe that if you major on the Bible, you'll figure it out and you won't get too far from it. If the Bible is all you need to operate the church, I don't believe that you need to comb through it in order to find every little nuance and every little statement. Instead, I think you'll major on doctrine instead of drama. You won't start a youth drama team to come and teach what God has written down and prescribed for us to preach. You won't start a church dance team. You'll focus on doctrine and teach that. I don't think we have to outlaw that. I think that comes natural to people who major on Scripture. I think you'll focus on print and not on a program. I heard in a denominational meeting one time, we're going to do something even if it's wrong. I said, we ain't. You might. We ain't. I'm not interested in doing something even if it's wrong. Well, why? Because I believe the Scripture is sufficient. Now, if you go the other way and you say, oh, no, we can only do in the church what we have clear example in Scripture, you're going to end up in some weird places because there's no end to where that will lead you. You'll be arguing over whether we should have an offering plate or an offering chest. No widow woman ever threw that money in an offering plate. She threw it in the chest. The early church brought their offerings down and laid them at the apostles' feet. So now we need to argue as can whether we can pass the plate or whether you need to come up and lay it at your pastor's feet. We need to argue over whether we have wine or grape juice. These are big deals if you take the regulative principle because we can only do that. We'll argue over what kind of instruments can be played or if instruments can be played. Is a piano okay? Whether well, pianos in Scripture. Are drums okay? There were drums in Scripture. Can you play an organ in church? Why don't we play the sack butt? That's my favorite biblical <laughs> instrument. Well, Brother Harold, what's the solution to all that? Believe the scriptures are sufficient. You see, there's volumes of books written on what you can and can't do in church. But if you just read the book we got laid in our lap right beside us, you won't fall in one of those pitfalls. I'm talking about the reason why he wrote. He said, I'm writing so you know how to act in church. And he doesn't give him an exhaustive list. But he gave him enough that if you do this, and what the Spirit also testifies that you know you should be doing, you'll be okay. I don't have to tell you what you can and can't play in church. I don't have to tell you. I had a guy tell me, you can't sing two hymns back to back in church. That's irreverent. 
I said, what, in the, what, what chapter and verse did you get that from? He said, well, brother, I believe in the regulative principle of worship. And I said, okay, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's three right there. Yeah, but you can't do it all together. <laughs> and I said, where'd you get this at? So-and-so's book said... And I said, well, where are you getting that information from another book? Did you sew that on the back of your Bible? Brother Harold, what's the solution to that? Know the scriptures are all you need. <laughs> if you follow and dive into and rely on the Bible as your guide, here's what will happen. You'll be reverent in church. You'll be holy in your life. You'll be Bible-based in what you do here. You'll be sanctified because it is the Word of God that sanctifies you. Christ prayed for your sanctification. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Or thy truth, thy truth. Thy word is truth. And it'll show. I hear people all the time, preachers all the time, complaining that their church members don't act like Christians in the world. And you go to their church, and their church acts like the world. I'm like, well, bro, you're training them to be this way. If you'll major on the Bible, make preaching the emphasis, make teaching the most important thing that you do, believe that the opening and explanation of this word is what the church needs most, all this other stuff will straighten itself out. That's what I believe. So we see the, re the revelation in verse 14. He wrote it down. We see the reason so he'd know how to act in church. Now let's look at the relationship in the middle part of verse 15. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. I want to deal with this phrase, which is the church of the living God. Three things need to be covered in that little phrase. Number one, the people. You do realize the church is made up of people, right? Google, Google has some debate on their map as to where this church exists. Ron said his Google Maps took him three miles that way. Russell said they were coming. They went three miles that way. I looked on mine last night, and Google said I should park here and walk about 100 yards in this cow pasture behind here. Yeah. <laughs> now, see, if you're one of these letter of the law guys, you're going to walk out in that cow pasture. But if you also have the Spirit of God accompanying your knowledge of the Word, you're going, no, I'm not walking in the cow pasture. My faith has become side. I see the building right there. You say, preacher, what are you getting at with this goofy story? Google recognizes church buildings. Scripture recognizes church people. Amen. The word for church is not building, it's ecclesia. It means the called out assembly. Amen. It's those that left over here and grouped up here. The relationship is people. Now, I didn't say the relationship is a person. Why? The church is not a one-man band. Have you ever seen a one-man band? The music ain't all that great, but I'm always impressed with the guy's ability to try. You know, he's stomping with this foot, he's kicking with this leg, and this arm's going this way, and he's blowing here and playing a violin on his back. And I mean, the impression there is, boy, that guy's really doing something. But if you were to turn your back, you would say, that is the absolute worst band I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> A lot of people think the church is a one-man band, and they're pretty, pretty impressive what they get away with and what they can do. But if you realize the church is an assembly of people and not one person, then you know what a church should look like, and you'll know what it should sound like. Too many times we see division in churches, and the division oftentimes occurs between the pulpit and the pew. We have pastors and we have people. The pastors are also part of the people. Even though they have a different role in the church, there's not just two offices. It's not just the pastor and the people. 
I heard a great story at a conference this week. Guy said that one of the deacons in a church told him, said, I sure wish we could find a pastor. I'm getting tired of mowing this grass. <laughs> what makes you think it's a pastor's job to mow grass? Well, I, he's the only paid staff person we got. You see, in a lot of churches, they don't recognize the relationship. When we look at our text, Paul says that you know how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church. The group of people, not just a building, a group of people, not just pastor and pew, but think about it this way. Sometimes churches will say, well, I, I know it's not pastor and people, it's not pat, pulpit and pew, but we'll say this, it's doers and don'ts. Well, we're the ones that do all the work around here. They don't. It's made up of Christians. And some Christians ain't nearly as active as the others. And some of them active ones need to sit down. If I had time, I'd preach a mini-sermon on being a busybody, but I don't have time and you want to eat lunch. It's people. And in the church, you're going to have young people that are ignorant. You're going to have old people that can't. And everyone in between... But a proper understanding of the ecclesia, the called out assembly, is that the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the eye can't say to the mouth, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the stomach, I don't need you. There are different parts in the church, some more active, some more wise, some doing nothing, some learning, some doing more than their fair share. But when we put all them together under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ, knitted together by the unity of the Spirit, it, under the authority of the Word of God, we got ourselves a church full of people. Amen. Which is the church of the living God. Number one, people. Number two, power. The living God. <laughs> Our God's active. Our God's active. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I, I prayed to God one time. He didn't do anything. He's not obligated to do anything. God never said, hey, I'm up in the heavens, just bored. If you need me, call me. A lot of times we don't call on him till we need him. I think about that lady trying to find a parking spot up front at the mall, praying, Lord, help me find a parking spot right up front so I can get in and out of this store. Oh, never mind, I found one. <laughs> is that not the way it works? Our God is a living God. He's powerful. I was eating yesterday. I went to Roland and was doing some work at the church. And I was going to go eat in a local restaurant. And I like Chinese food. And I found out there's a Chinese place in Roland. I said, man, I'm going there. So, man, I trucked over there and parked and went in there. And it was like I walked into some kind of Buddhist temple. There were these, I don't think it's Buddhist, it's something else. There were these golden statues holding bowls of fruit with lays around them, you know, the flower rings around them. And then there was this big picture of a family with a bunch of names on it, and there were like flowers in the middle and like four bowls with lids on them on each side. I was like, is that ashes in here? I mean, we got... <laughs> And then I looked over on this wall, and there's some kind of liturgical calendar with all of these little deities on them. One of them, they're holding fruit. One of them, they're pouring out water. One of them, they're providing a fire. And I thought, you know, that's your God right there. A carved out piece of wood hanging on the wall, part of a calendar. That's your God right there. A little golden plastic statue holding a bowl of fruits and nuts. My God dwells in the heavens. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's alive and well. And he knows me and he loves me and he cares for me. And not one thing that happens to me is outside of his control and will. And every bit of it that happens to me, good, bad, or indifferent, is for his glory and my betterment. And I'm not going to go to heaven to ask him why this happened. I'm going to go to heaven and praise him for loving me when I didn't deserve it. Why? Because I have a living God, a powerful God. 
which is the house of the living God. We see people. We see power. Number three, we see property. Whose house is it? It's God's house. When we say God's house, we put the apostrophe S. If you leave the apostrophe out, you're like that fella at the Chinese restaurant. You got a whole bunch of gods. You got the corn god. You got yourself a totem pole. You got the buffalo god, the corn god, and the god of the volcano and all that. But if you put the apostrophe in there, that's ownership. That's possession. This means that it's God's house. That means he owns it and we belong to him. Ownership should be evident. What? No, you're not. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Every Christian is now the possession of Jesus Christ. We were purchased on the cross of Calvary. We were in the slave market of sin, in bondage to sin, enslaved to sin, unable to do anything righteous, holy, or good. But when Christ died on the cross, he purchased us. Do we not sing that? Amen. He owns us. And if the church is made up of Christians, he owns the church. It should be evident. My dad made it evident that I was Harold Smith, Harold and Patty Smith's son. If I began to act like I wasn't Harold and Patty Smith's son, my dad would have a meeting with me. <laughs> and he would say something along the lines of this. We're not going to allow you to act this way. We have an expectation for you in this family. Our kids don't talk that way. Our kids don't go to that place. Our kids don't act like that. You're going to act like this. And if you don't like that, then you go get yourself a job and a house and you go do it your way. But as long as you're here, you're doing it my way. I wonder who the earth belongs to. I wonder who the church belongs to. I was on the earth and bound to Satan. I was on the earth blinded by the prince of the power of the air. But God came and opened my eyes and through the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit convicted me that I was a sinner, granted me faith. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I turned from my sins and I submitted to him and I called him Lord. All who call upon the name of the Lord. Don't you skip Lord. If he ain't your Lord, you ain't saved. If it's his house, that's ownership. And if you're in his house, you ought to look like it. Man, don't make your pastor stand up here on the day of your funeral and lie about what he thinks where you really are. Put yourself in the place of a preacher someday. Hey, will you come do grandpa's funeral? I'm like, wasn't your grandpa a sailor and talk like it? Wasn't he an alcoholic, like, drank like a fish? I don't really know as though I could say anything great about Grandpa. Church member, the sufficiency of the scripture is this, that if you believe it, you look like it. Now let me give you a word of caution here. I don't think you'll all be Amish. You know the Amish have some rules, don't they? They'll tell you how to get rid of your mustache. They'll tell you how to cut your hair. They'll tell you what color hat to wear. They'll tell you when it's legal to ride in a tractor and when you have to ride on a horse. I've yet to figure that one out. You say, well, Brother Harold, if, if we're God's people and we ought to look like God's people, why shouldn't we mandate that everybody grow a chin strap beard except the women? The men grow a chin strap beard and we all, we all wear black clothes and nobody rides in a car so the world knows who we are. I'm going to tell you something. You can go play dress up all you want to and you won't fool anybody. I saw Santa at the mall every year. Never once thought that was the real Santa. I said, Mom, I got up in his lap. That beard was fake. <laughs> There's a lot of people walking around with a haircut and a suit and tie on, and I say, that's fake. He said, well, Brother Harold, how can we have this kind of everybody looking right, but not all looking exactly the same? How can we have worship service that's not regulated down to every little thing we say and do, but still look like we're Christians? You ever eat at a chain restaurant in some other state? You ever go in there and say, yeah, I'm going to have the, 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 the catfish. Well, sir, we don't have catfish up north. Same name on the sign. Same menu. 
same plates, just don't have everything on the menu. Does that mean they're not the same restaurant that's in the South? No, they're the same restaurant. They're different based upon where they are. Is that cultural dictating it? No. It's that we don't have an exact mandate to do this. The Bible doesn't say shave your mustache. The Bible doesn't say that a button is evil. That's the teaching of men that say you have to use a hook and latch. If the Bible doesn't mandate it, we shouldn't either. Well, what's the telltale markings of a Christian? That we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. We're strikingly different from the world. It ain't what we wear. It's what we say and where we go and what we do. Lastly, I don't want to burn anything in a crock pot over there. Let's look at the latter part of verse 15. The church, the house of the living God, is the pillar and ground of of the truth the pillar and the ground of truth this literally means it's the pole and the foundation it's the pillar it's the support structure it's think of it this way it's the billboard for the truth we all know what a billboard is you know those billboards, they just got like one great big pole that comes up, then they got a little catwalk, and then they got a big sign, and then they stretch a tarp over that with a picture on it. But what you don't see about that big old steel pole that's supporting all that is it goes in the ground about 12 or 14 feet. Otherwise, any little wind would blow that big thing over. And that support system that comes up, uh, that thing's solid. Otherwise, it'd just fold over. The church is the foundation and the pole for the Word of God. Yeah. Looks like this. This is it. This is what we got right here. This is what we show the world. Well, why can't I marry another man? Why can't I beat my wife? If I can't marry a man, why can't I beat my wife? <laughs> why can't I stay drunk all the time? Do illicit drugs? Who made you boss? I'm not the boss. I'm holding up the authority. That's the way it works. We don't offer our opinions. We're not explicitly forbidden running in church. I don't recommend it, but you can't find a chapter and verse for that. We don't offer our opinions. We don't offer our traditions. You can't go to church unless they just have piano and organ. Anything above that, that's your tradition. You can't sing a song written after 1982. The, go the Gaithers quit writing in 1982. That's your tradition. Well, if it's not Southern gospel, it ain't gospel. That's your tradition. That's your opinion. We, we don't offer that. That's not what we're holding up to the world. We don't offer our culture. You get outside the Bible Belt, churches look different. Christians look different, but they still look like Christians. Still look like Christians. We don't offer our friendship. Our job is not to unite with any charity group in the area. Our job is to hold up the Word of God. I'm not saying it's forbidden that you help the United Way or whatever. But I know a lot of churches that just boast on all the things they raise money for. You need to quit raising money and raise up the Word of God. We don't list our preferences. We don't mandate a dress code. Should have said amen right there. Remember, I preach as fast as you listen. When you get sleepy, I just slow down and go at your pace. We don't mandate haircuts. Catching on. Might make Baptist out of y'all for lunch. 
You say, well, Brother Harold, if we don't mandate dress codes and haircuts and we're not friends with the world and we don't promote our culture and export our traditions and offer our opinions, no, we hold up the truth. That's what my text said. Not a truth, not some truth, not a little bit of truth. The truth. It means all of it. Amen. The church's job is to lift up the whole book. Right. Now look, that don't mean we're over here beating them over the head with it. It don't mean we're over here smacking them around and forcing them. You're going to like it. You're going to eat it and you're going to like it. No, our job is to hold it up. Now the world's going to drive by and go, bunch of idiots, bunch of wackos. Look at those people, structuring their life. Yeah. Well, they ought to be out here enjoying this great sunny day on a Saturday. They're gathered up there in Vesta listening to a guy preach. What a bunch of weirdos. That's right. But here's what I found happens. Those same people that think we're weirdos, when God sets his sights upon them, the Holy Spirit begins to convict them. Through life circumstances, they find that the world can't answer their problems. Alcohol and drugs can't drown it out. They have no solution for what's going on in their life. All of a sudden, they drive by, and here we are. It's holding up the Bible. We're not forcing lost people to act like saved people. We're not mandating moral laws so that they do it our way. We're just saying we've got the answers. And until God opens blinded eyes and deaf ears to see the truth of the Word of God, this don't look attractive. But if God opens eyes and opens ears and your church is over here having a drama team and a dance party and trying to look like the world, they're not seeing what they need and they're still driving down the road. This is all they need. It means we hold up the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Y'all watch Judge Wapner, don't you? <laughs> we promote the truth. We send preachers out, paid for by the church to spread and promote the truth. We preach the truth. We proclaim it. Every time we meet, we open it up and expound it. We practice the truth. We live it out in our daily lives. It shows up, as my pastor said, in our families and in our homes. We practice the truth when we go to work. We practice the truth when we go to the ball field. We practice the truth everywhere that we go and the world sees the truth because that's what the church is, the pillar and foundation and ground of truth. We publish the truth. We give away the truth. It was given to us in writing and we reprint it and reprint it and reprint it and reprint it and it literally exists in every single home. It's all over the internet. We share it. We publish it. We make it known and everybody has access to it in this country. We prize the truth. We don't show up at church and go, boy, I hope Jared don't preach today. <laughs> We say like they said with Ezra, bring us the book. Open it up. I want to hear it. When we find ourselves in times of trouble and, 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 and trial and struggle, we don't get out the newspaper and look at our horoscope. We open up the word of God and say, feed me, I'm in trouble. If we ever become known for anything other than a support system for the Word of God so that the world knows where the truth is, we cease to be a church. We may have Christians there. People may get together and have a religious meeting. But if the world can't see that we value the book that I hold in my hands and we structure our lives according to it, well, they'll start telling jokes about the church being full of hypocrites. You say, well, Brother Harold, they're already doing that. All the more to hoist this book up on top of the church and say, this is it. This is all we need and we have it. We're complete in the word of God. Thank you for listening.